welcome to the first seminars organized by the first seminar of this year, organized by the Gather Group on Game Theory. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Victor Martinez de Arveni. He is associate professor at the ESS Department of Production, Technologies and Operation Management. He joined the ES in 2004 after earning a PhD in Operation Research Center at MIT and also an engineer degree at the Ecole Polytechnic in France. And we met him uh, in, uh, we, we met him in, uh, the first time in Elche in 2008 at the conference Elche organized by our center. And uh, since then, we, uh, we keep uh, in touch uh, with him. Uh, we, are uh, we are delighted uh, he is here again uh, for telling us about uh, his interesting research on uh, the fashion industry. And I live uh, with him and with his talk entitled A Close uh, Lob Approach, Dynamic Assortment Plan. Thank you, Anna. So, thanks a lot for the invitation to, to Elche again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, uh, what I, I would like to do, and I hope uh, everybody can see me and hear me clearly, is um, try to explain some of the things we've been doing in research in the last years. Um, and just to tell you, give you a word on my background, I started doing very classical supply chain work, optimization, some game theory. And in the last three, four years, most of my research is on the, on the retail industry. And in particular, on fashion retailing, which I think is a fascinating mm, topic because uh, it is very complex, very random, and uh, very the, w the way it is managed is usually very artistic. So great potential for us uh, to try to you know, provide some structure and give some guidelines on how to do things. So um, this is a paper that I'm presenting today, joint work with my, my postdoc at ESE, Ezra. She uh, um, has a PhD from Mogazici in, in Istanbul. Um, and uh, we've been working together for two years. And this is a paper that we finished in November of last year. So we're, you know, we hope to hear back from the journal soon. So. <laughs> Now let, let me give you some background on the, on the industry, on fashion retailing. So what, how, how is fashion retailing different from grocery retailing uh, and supermarkets where you go and buy food, for example? This is an, an, uh, uh, an image from a, a store of a well-known brand. So as a store, things are going to be very, very different. Very different in terms of how they look and how they are managed. So in particular, you see this is one of the walls. The displays are not shelves where you just put things. So you have a, a, a whole component of merchandising that is much more sophisticated, number one. And if you think about how, you, how to manage this, is this is how the store looks today. But um, if you ask me how it should look tomorrow, it's probably going to, should probably be, um, very, very different in terms of what products should be there, um, how much of each product should be there, and what price I should be selling these items for, right? And, and in particular, what is, I think, fascinating about, about fashion is that the, the trends in the market and what people want is going to change very quickly. And this is something we see in the data, that products age quickly. And the life cycle of a product in a supermarket, you think about, I don't know, Colacao, it's been there for, what, 50 years? It's re you know, roughly the same thing. Now this thing is going to be there for a season, six months maximum. And then if you decide to sell it again next season, you're going to do it a little bit differently. So you're going to redesign it a little bit. Um, and then even if you redesign it a few times, after a couple of years, it dies. So this is something you need to manage actively. And what I'm trying to do in the research is try to provide some guidelines on how to do this well. 
or how to provide elements for better decision making on this, in this direction. So this is what we call dynamic assortment planning. So let me, let me give you, you know, a hint of how this is done in the industry and how this was done tradi traditionally. Typically, the way you see a store today is, a lo is the end of a long process of design and production that is typically done. If you think about how you, what people are doing right now, right now uh, they are thinking uh, about the, you know, probably uh, fall winter of this year is already done. So they are thinking about spring summer of 2015. So that's what designers are thinking right now. Then, um, typically you have a very long process of design and production, then you put things into the store. The way this used to be done was to push everything at the beginning of the season and then let these items in the store for six months. Um, sometimes uh, things would sell out, so you would sell everything and then you would have like an empty spot in the store. Sometimes uh, you would have excess inventory um, and at the end of the season you would remove all the excess inventory through, the, through discounts. Right? So you have the rebajas started from this type of, of, of planning. Right? Now this has changed in, in recent years because of what is called fast fashion. Fast fashion, as you know, what is fast fashion is what we've seen in the industry is new players emerge um, and do things differently and you see from this ranking this is the top dogs in the in the industry who do you see on top today you have Inditex you have H&M which are different ways of doing something in, in the spirit quite similar and then you have the, the long you know the leader for many years the gap that is now flat and they've been changing things but essentially there's not growing anymore it has trouble just catch, you know, catching up with the others and you see another one, the fourth one here, Fast Retailing uh, do you know this company, Fast Retailing? No. this is Uniqlo, this is a brand have you heard about Uniqlo? it's one of these upcoming brands that is doing very good basics, cheap and good quality uh, I think it's a, probably a different, it's called Fast Retailing but it's perhaps a different concept compared to a Zara, for example. In any case, what you see is there is a change in the industry and what, is, what it has made the success of Inditex or H&M is the fact that they are running this process. The long, the, this historical process, they don't do that anymore. They do things differently, they do things faster and they do things with a lot more frequency into the store. Uh, which means that the stores are going to be managed very di in a very different way. So we have uh, actually a couple of, of review articles on, on the industry, but let me give you a hint of uh, what is the main differences. So essentially there is a main, uh, uh, so what I compare here is on the left Zara, middle I have H&M, and on the right I have the Gap. So main differences in terms of how they run the assortment, Zara and H&M have a, f uh, a f big fraction of the assortment that is what they call fashion products. Fashion products are essentially new products that come, you know, that appear during the season or just for a very short period of time. And the rest being basic that are always, always going to be there for many seasons. So Gap typically carries basics. Now these percentages have evolved over time, but Gap is known or was known for, uh, basic, as for basic products. Uh, now you think about Zara, there is a f significant amount of products that is just into the store this week, it's going to be here for six weeks and then will you know, be removed and never seen again. So this is what I call fashion. What this means is that the arrivals are going to happen weekly, typically, uh, compared to the gap where there is nothing new really every week. Um, and then the consequences of this way of managing the products is that the way the supply chain has to work will be also very different. Uh, you're going to have uh, suppliers in different places. Typically you need suppliers closer to the market so that you can do things quicker, faster. So uh, Zara and H&M you see close to 50% is uh, on quick response. And while the gap has very little quick response. And then finally, if you look at lead times, 
Uh, the responsive part that is close to market is, is fast, two to six weeks depending on which category we're talking about. The t-shirts are the fastest ones, the, you know, the ones that are a bit more complicated and for fabric take longer. And then you have the efficient supply chain are typically what you, the order you place in China, in Bangladesh, that take three months, something like this. Okay? So very different in terms of financial and, 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 and indicators. The fast fashion model seems to be better. Um, now, we will see if in 10 years we can still say the same, but this is what we have right now. So what is the consequence of this different way of working, and, and I'm getting to, to the research question, is that when you have stores that are changing all the time, people are interested in going to the store often. Uh, in, com in contrast, if you go to the Gap, you go there once in the beginning of the season, and then you don't, you don't need to go there again because you know what is, what is there. Okay? So what we're trying to, to do here is try to build models that capture this very dynamic aspect of novelty. Um, and in fact, one of the ob objectives of this work is to tell people how to manage novelty dynamically. So let me give you another example. This is from 7-Eleven um, in Japan. This is a retailer for food. And the, what you see here, and I'll tell you why, why I'm showing you this chart, is this is the consumption of noodles week, you know, month by month over uh, two and a half years, well, two, two years or so. So what do you see? So this company does something similar to Zara. Every month they introduce a new flavor for the noodles. And then what happens? <laughs> the, when it's introduced, everybody tries it. The next month, less people try it. The mo month after, less people try it. Until after maybe six months, the item is removed because nobody wants it anymore. So what you see here is something similar to what we observe in fashion. Actually, we're working with data and we see something very similar to this. That Assuming that the, the demand is stationary doesn't make any sense in this industry. We cannot assume that because it's not true. So you have very strong effects of time passing. When you age, the pr products become less popular. Now, a any idea or any why, why this may be so? You know, why, why does the demand for noodles, which seems to be a very basic product, go down over time? I'm going to propose a, a, an explanation, but do, do you have like an intuition on why this may be like this? I mean, think about yourself eating noodles. I don't like noodles. So you don't like noodles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll eat the basic ones, and maybe if there's a new store, I'll try it, and then I see, okay, if it's good, it's good, but most probably it won't be that good, I'll switch back to my uh, basic normal noodles. So wh which one is the basic? Without any flavor. It is not here. So maybe there is another one that is not here. Maybe. So now, what you just described is something that has been studied in economics called variety seeking. So you go for something different because you like variety and you like trying new things. Mm -hmm. And once you've tried, you're going to switch to something else. And maybe you have something that is basic that gives you like always a some good utility and you try a strange one once and then you switch back to the basic. So there, are, there is work in trying to explain this mechanism um, and I think what happens here which may, is connected to this is it's may, it may be because intrinsically people want something different and they change. It may be because you want noodles and what happens is you got something newer than what you have. So maybe the way, the reason why things go down is because 7-Eleven introduced something new. If they hadn't introduced something new, maybe it would have not gone down. So there is a part that is maybe exogenous and built into the, into the customer's mind, but there's another part that can be managed here. 
Um, so this is something we can test. So we're doing that with data. And what, we're, uh, we're, what I'm going to propose is we will build a model that captures these two elements together. The fact that people change their mind and, and go for, you know, try and then leave. And the fact that um, you can manage that actively by introducing, that this decay can be actually managed. So let me show you a um, little bit the, the, the research question. Now, how do people deal with dynamic interests? They introduce new products. So that's the main, the main tool they have. Um, and you can do that because you have very short design to market um, lead times, so the fast fashion model. And then you can do that because you have good information about what you're selling. So every week I can look at how things have sold and I can go and call my Portuguese supplier saying I need in very quickly for next week I need a new product. Like that has to look like this and like that. So that I can do. So what we're trying to to do in this paper is actually be prescriptive and say if this, this is a situation of fast fashion and, and perfect information, closed loop um, control should work best. So we are going to study how firms should change their assortment policies dynamically as time evolves, as demand changes. And specifically, we're interested in products to introduce in every week, for example, in which categories um, so that's, that's essentially the main question we are, we're asking. And we're going to build a model to do this and give you, a, so I'm going to give you some, some results. Let me just give you before some idea of what has been done in the past. Um, there exists uh, some literature on multi-period assortment planning. Um, assortment planning is the, the whole topic where you decide what is included in the assortment, what is not included in the assortment. So typically there are products or this t-shirt, do I put it in the store? Yes or no? This is a decision problem. You put that in, in a context uh, uh, with you know, real size, gives you a big OR problem that is difficult to solve. So there's lots of papers in this respect. And in particular, there are multi-period versions of this. What do you typically have in these models? Uh, you have uncertainty about the demand. So what you have is I can introduce a certain number of products and there is a trade-off between introducing the products that where I earn the most money, the ones that are most popular that I, I'm going to sell the most, so would that maximize my profit today, versus the ones where I could introduce them and learn about the true demand of this product. And I can only learn that if I introduce it. If I don't test it, I cannot learn. So that gives us an exploration versus exploitation and trade-off. And there are Bayesian models for this, starting with uh, Karen Galli in 2007. And later on, there, there has been some work on non-parametric models, where w what it is done is trying to maxi or optimize the speed of learning of the system subject to asymptotic of optimality of the policies. So this is one branch of, of, of you know, one stream of literature. There's one little problem with this, is this is typically assumes that there is a true demand that you can learn. Now what we see in the data is that this is not realistic. The demand is nothing but true or stable. It's, it's always changing, so the issue is how do you do, how do, you do that? So you can even think about a, a Bayesian model with with trends, but that's much more difficult. It's not been done yet. So, uh, but this is just to say that we also need to consider other types of problems, which is models with built-in decays. And this has been done in, in marketing, uh, in the movie industry. And as you know, movies these days, uh, they are very in, in the movie theaters for a very short time. So this, in this paper, out of a few UCLA professors, um, what you see, they test how the, the life of a movie evolves. And they you know, describe that, that behavior with, with some empirics. And then um, uh, another paper, recent paper with, uh, of myself with, uh, with co-authors, uh, Felipe Carr and, and Pat Rusmevichentong, <coughs> explores the same type of model from the movie industry, except that the, with an open loop formulation. So the problem of, I have a catalog of a thousand 
products, what should I put in in the first week, what should I put in in the second week, etc. Et so what we do in this paper is trying to extend in this particular part with a feedback and a, a real-time control on, on a sort. And then we have a um, couple of review papers on the fast fashion industry where we detail this, we give some background on the, on the, on the literature. So let me um, jump into the model. What are our objectives is to provide something where we can model and, and guide the responsiveness of a retailer, where we can revise assortment decisions over time. We are going to consider different types of categories. Okay, so we have n uh, different categories, and you can think about dresses, t-shirts, jeans as different things. Um, and we're going to take decisions in each one of the categories, decide how much to invest in each category in each week during the selling season. And I'm going to talk about introductions, but in reality, the model can be understood as any effort you put in the category, be it uh, introductions, but also promotions, uh, product display issues, um, incentives, etc., etc. So selling incentives to sell things that are going to change the what I will call attractiveness of a product. Okay, and this is going to be a closed loop approach, uh, and we're going to compare this closed loop approach with open loop ones, where you take all the decisions at the beginning of the season, and also to to the traditional process where you would put everything together at the beginning. Okay, so this is what I call uh, open loop and front loaded. So, let me jump to the math. Uh, it's going to be brief. I'm not going to go into the details. If you want more, it's in the paper. But I'm going to give you the ingredients of the model. The model is the following. Uh, we're going to use an what, what is, is a well-known model. It's called an attraction model for the demand. So, what does it mean? It means that a given category, I, in a week T, uh, is going to have a demand equal to this function, yit divided by 1 plus the sum of yj's. Okay? What does it mean? This is, first of all, notice this is a number between 0 and 1. Uh, so it's a market share model. Uh, second, uh, you see that there is this, some parameters, yit. So let me explain what, what these are. This is what we call the attractiveness of, pro of category I in week T. So these are useful, uh, and empirically this is something that is very useful. Uh, given an assortment of products, you give one number for each product, and with that you can actually explain the whole market share of, the, of, the, of this product over time. Right? So uh, this is well known that, for example, the, the multinomial logic model is one particular case of this, um, and it's been very, you know, very, it's very broadly used in, in both in academia and, and in industry as well. So what we're going to do as a decision maker is we're going to start every week with a certain attractiveness, xit, and we're going to decide whether we want to increase it to yit. Okay, so we're going to put money into the category to increase the attractiveness of, pro of a product. And a way to do that would be every new product you bring in is going to give you one additional unit of attractiveness. So if you tell me you want to go from three to five, it means you need to introduce two new products. So this is what we're, what, what we're building. Um, here you notice there's a one in the, in the, in the demand, one plus. One is a, just a parameter, it's a normalization. This is what you call the outside option. So as you see, the sum of demands in a particular week is going to be the sum of y's over one plus the sum of y's. So this one tells you how many people are not buying anything from the store. It's also very classic. And, and then finally, what you have is uh, the dynamics of this. So is, is this clear? Do we have questions Questions on this? Not yet? Good. And, and if there is some question from the distance, you know, please jump in. Uh, so, um, the dynamics. How are we going to model the, this decays? Is we're going to put in a stochastic process that changes the 
y over time, the, y, the different y's. So right now, imagine I have five units of attractiveness. This is what I've installed in my store today. And in, in next week, this five is going to become something different, something lower. So this is what essentially I'm trying to create this decay that I showed in the, in the, in the file. Um, so yit minus one is going to become xit, which is the previous attractiveness multiplied by some some decay factor, epsilon. Mm -hmm. okay? And then from there, I'm going to decide to invest UIT to bring it to a new state, YIT. So now you start seeing the ingredients. It's really the demand model is simple. The um, transitions and the dynamics over time are relatively simple. Now, of course, if you formulate the whole thing, it's going to be actually quite difficult. So let me, let me just show you the dynamic program. So we're going to use dynamic programming to solve this. And the way you formulate it is you're going to define JT as the profit to go um, for starting with attractiveness XT, this is a vector, until the end of the season. Okay, and how do you write that? Is essentially this part, and maybe I can I can point this. Yes. So you can see there is this part over here that tells you how much money I am making this week, <coughs> minus these two parts combined. This is minus C I U I T. If you remember from the previous, which is how much money I'm investing this week. So this is how much money I'm collecting this week. Revenues minus costs. And to this, I'm going to add the future uh, profit, profit to go function. Okay, so this is very standard dynamic programming. Um, and here, what you know is that the future state is going to be simply a decay over what we did this week. Okay, and so, because I'm maximizing over the y's, I have this constraint, I can only increase attractiveness, but I'm free, uh, essentially, I'm going to maximize in every period. So this is why we call it closed loop approach, because every week you can take decisions based on the current information. Mm -hmm. And compared with the open one, if they, you don't have to do every week, I mean, it's uh, open. In, in open loop, the difference would be, you would have to decide everything at the beginning independent on the different variations that may happen. So this is a lot more flexible um, and in fact also simpler to solve, surprisingly. <laughs> well, surprisingly, maybe not so surprisingly, but uh, if you have degrees of freedom, sometimes you simplify the issues. So uh, some of the parameters I have not described, PI is the profit margin for product I, CI is the cost of, um, you know, linear cost of investing in product I. T is uh, essentially the number of revisions during the planning horizon. So this goes up to JT, which is the final period. After that, we're finished. Uh, N is the number of categories, as I said. Okay, so questions about the formulation? Because then I'm going to give you results, not explaining. So this is standard dynamic programming that we're going to use, uh, but you know, we'll try to keep it, keep it there, yeah? So, next. So, le let me give you some results. And let me start with this simple uh, case of one, only one category. So, if you do that, these sums that you would have in the formulation would disappear. You would only have one number. So, what do we show? We show that it, it is optimal, that in every week, you can actually um, define a level B. And the optimal policy can be described uh, in a way that if you are below B, you should invest up to B, increase it to B. If you are above B, don't do anything. So this is very similar to base stock policies in inventory management. Here, because we're talking about assortment and attractiveness, this is what we call assort up to policy. Right? So if you are below this target, invest. If you are above the target, don't do anything. Now, we have some properties on BT. They are, um, will be decreasing over time, while well, non-increasing. And we have 
some closed forms. So in the um, in single period, we have a formula to calculate this that comes from optimizing a static problem. In infinite horizon, we have another formula. Uh, and you notice that the only difference, so first of all, that the, the infinite horizon level is higher than the finite, so than the single period uh, threshold. And the difference is this factor, one minus beta epsilon. So what does it mean? It means that as you have more and more periods ahead of you, um, you are going to increase your target. So you have more periods to go, you're willing to invest more in the category because you're going to use it for longer. And, it ha and this level has a direct effect or is directly in, uh, influenced by beta, the discount factor, how much you value the future compared to today. And epsilon is how much uh, the product will survive over time. Epsilon remembers how it decays over time. So epsilon bar here will be the average decay. So for products that have a very, imagine there is no uh, no discount factor. So beta is equal to one. Imagine you have products that only will last for one period. And then, so the, I put something in the, in the story this week. Next week, that's worth zero. And people don't want it anymore. So beta epsilon bar is going to be zero. And therefore, whether you have a static problem or an infinite rising problem, you're going to invest exactly the same amount. For products that last for very, very long, epsilon bar is very high and then you would get a very small number in the denominator. The amount of, uh, so essentially what this is saying is products that last very long, you should actually put a lot of them in the store because you pay the cost once and then you, you, get, you sell them over many, 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 many weeks. So that's properties we find. Uh, let me illustrate this uh, or maybe before that, explain the, the connection, you see that there is a oops, uh, th this, there is a structure, the structure is actually similar related to the inventory models um, and in particular to models with product obsolescence deterioration so this, this is the connection now some illustrations this is as a function of t, so this would be so eight, a problem with eight periods or with 11 periods. And the figure on the left shows you for various levels of average decay, what happens to, the, to these thresholds. You see, as the, aver the epsilon bar is higher, my inventory levels are going to be higher. You know, there is, they're going to be monotonic at, at the very end of the horizon and then flat which is what we show in the, in the theorem. Now, the effect of uncertainty, so here you see these levels are independent of the, the deviation or the uncertainty over, over epsilon. Uh, we find that that's true in the, final or in the final period and in the first, in the infinite horizon uh, period. Um, in intermediate levels, it, it, it has a, uh, an importance and you see that with more uncertainty, the inventories are going to be, or the sort up to levels are going to be lower. So there is a, this is some sensitivity analysis around our, our levels. So let me now extend it very, very quickly. Uh, when you have more than one category, so now think about not only one, you know, the store is not made of just one type of product, but you have like now dresses and t-shirts. So this is what I call categories. You have two of them two types. Now, two cases. First case is when, they, when you make the same money from selling a t-shirt and selling a dress. Okay. In that case, the, product, the, the problem is well behaved, so we have some structure and what we show is this proposition that is similar, is an extension of what we have in one dimension, is we show that there is, uh, there is a number of thresholds, BIT, in every period such that if you start below these levels for all the items, for all the categories, it is optimal to actually increase the level to BIT. However, if you are above these levels, just in one category, may not be all of them, but just one, then it's not going to be true that you go up to a level. 
the yit optimal may depend on everything else. So this is not a base stock policy, but it's something that is, you know, where we have a very clear thresholds identified. Okay, so again, uh, what is nice about this is you can now have close form results for the extreme cases of one period or infinite, uh, infinite number of periods. So, for a single period problem, it is optimal to just invest in one category that is determined by the one with the lowest cost. Okay. Uh, with infinite horizon, it is optimal to invest in one category that is characterized by the lowest like this virtual cost here of C, uh, CJ mm, modified with the life of the product. Okay, this beta epsilon bar of J. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that in, in the extreme cases of very long horizon or very short horizon, it is optimal to just focus on one category. Forget about a store, will essentially, it, is, it becomes optimal when you just focus on one category. The rest, don't put anything there. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that the whole complexity of many categories collapses and just you go to one. Now there is one, I mean if you've noticed, there is one little problem with this. Is that now the category that you would carry if you had just one period to go, may be different from the one you would carry if you have very long periods. Which means that if you, if you take any intermediate solution, you're going to see a combination of both. So it's not true that it's always optimal to just carry one category. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're going to carry few, and I can give you uh, an illustration, a little proposition that shows that for even two periods, it, it is optimal, even in simple cases, it is optimal to carry two categories at the same time. And the math becomes, I'll spare, I'll spare the math, but it becomes horrible, honestly. Um, but at least we have, <coughs> we, you know, we have, a, we can, can construct counterexamples. So let me give you an example now with five periods, numerically two categories. Uh, category one is, you can see, is more expensive, but has a higher epsilon, which means it costs me more to produce, say, imagine category one is a dress, category two is a t-shirt. So. Dresses are more expensive to design, but then once I put it in, they survive better in the store. People have more patience and can, are willing to buy it for longer. S on the other hand, t-shirt is the opposite, cheaper to make, but also they decay faster. Mm -hmm. So what do you see? What is the optimal policy? Is to start the season with lots of dresses, because this is something that will survive, that will age better. Towards the middle of the season, start shifting the attention and start putting t-shirts in. So, <coughs> what we can do is we can show what happens in the last period, we can show what happens in the first period, we can optimize on that, uh, but what happens in the middle cannot be solved. I mean, or we cannot, we have not been able to show any, any structure there. So, but at least numerically you can do, you can do many things. So, now that's the easy case with many, many categories. Now, let me add one twist. In practice, categories will also have different margins. So, it's not, you don't collect the same money if you sell it. Uh, typically, you make more money if you sell a, a dress than when you sell a t-shirt. So, when you put that into the problem, it's a big mess because you, the problem becomes, loses all the structure or convexity or concavity structure, that, be, that is lost. And then that means you cannot guarantee that, uh, you know, that any structure that you would think of thresholds will not work anymore. Fortunately, we, we have one result, is that even when you have different margins, in the extremes, so in the static problem last, last uh, period, uh, or with very long horizon, the infinite horizon case, and the optimal policy remains a single category investment. So just invest in one category. And you can see, compared to what we had before, uh, now how do you choose which category to, to use? You can have this formula, which is 
you need to look at the one that maximizes square root of p minus square root of c. That comes from just manipulations on, on what we have. Uh, now, it means if they all cost the same, pick the product that gives you the most revenue. If they have the same price, pick the one that has the, the lowest cost. And in general, maybe you need to look at both. Okay. Infinite horizon, the same, same story, except that the cost becomes like a mm, virtual cost that takes into account decay. And we have the same problems. This works in the extremes. In the middle, we don't know how it goes. And we do know that it's not well behaved. So you may have multiple uh, local maxima in the control function, which means not tractable, not pretty, and uh, we we'll leave it for for future work. <laughs> so, this is all I have. A any questions at this point? This is all our my, our structural results are about how do you control a, a complex system like this? And we show that usually it's a through a threat. You have to determine the right threshold and go up to that level. So, that's I think what all, all we can we can do there. Now, what I think is interesting is to see, okay, fine, you, you tell us that this, it's very interesting to do closed loop. Now, the reality is, well, is this really useful? I mean, all this complication, all these feedbacks. Now, to just have a feeling of whether this is useful or not, what we did was compare this to open loop policies. Open loop policies are very similar, except that you need to decide everything at the beginning. So here we had, if you remember, our control is what we called UIT. So UIT, what we did is decide it based on the current information. So if I force you to actually decide UIT at the beginning of the season, now what is the, what is the optimum? The op optimum you, you see is now the discounted, um, the discounted profits over time you will see there are plenty of epsilons in this formulation, which means these are, this is like a mixture of, of logit models. Very difficult to even calculate. And here you can think of, you need to consider the possible scenarios regarding the case. So this is very difficult to compute and even more so to, to optimize it. And it's related to, to what we did in, in, in a previous paper, except that in the previous paper, um, we didn't have any randomness on the decays, which means this was really one function instead of sums of, you know, there was no, no expectation in there. Okay, so one, just one scenario. So clearly the closed loop approach will do better than this because it has more flexibility. So we measure this as what we call the value of responsiveness. So how much do we gain by doing things on real time compared to doing, it, doing them all at the, at the, in the first period? So that's one. One switch. Oops. Uh, we're going to compare that also to what I call front-loaded policies, which are the same open-loop policy, the best open-loop policy that puts everything in the beginning. So I add one constraint with the the f the, the the additional uh, constraint of putting zero in periods two, periods three, until the end of the season. And this, again, will do better. Th this will do worse than open loop policies. We know that because it's more constrained. So we measure that gain as this is what we call the value of novelty. So just to, to recap here, we have compared to, compared to traditional process where you put everything in the beginning. First thing you can do is start spreading the introductions over the season. This is what we call the value of novelty. So that's one improvement. The second improvement is no, not only that, but also the type of controls are going to depend on what you see on real time. This is what we call the value of responsiveness. And what was done previously is show that this can be significant and interesting for retailers. So what I'm trying to, and what I'll show you is, well, not only value of novelty can be interesting, but sometimes the real value is not in novelty in, in itself, but in, on feedback. So let me show you a chart, numerical experiment with uh, just one category, price equal to one. 
and I'm going to change the value of the cost. So what do you see here on the, the dotted line is the value of novelty. This is what is known. Value of novelty told, you know, uh, is essentially telling you that for very cheap costs, there is really no advantage in novelty. Because you can put so much in the store in the beginning that you know, the store will be full anyway and that's fine. Okay? For very expensive costs, the value of novelty again is very low because it's so expensive that you're going to put so little that in both cases you know it's better to put it in the beginning of the season that's the most efficient now in the middle you have this curve over here that goes up to like 12 percent in this in this scenario that tells you well for intermediate costs you can gain up to 12 percent more profit if you introduce things during the season because it's a better way to manage this decay over time. Now, what do we bring with this paper is, well, not only this, is the value of responsiveness. Actually, in this regime is not so, not so relevant. You will maybe add maybe 5%. However, for more expensive costs, value of, of novelty adds zero. But through feedback, we can actually create maybe 5%, 8% value additional to what, what we have. Which means that there, is, there are regimes of intermediate costs where the value of dynamic assortments is not through spreading introductions during the season, but it's through being able to react to, uh, to bad situations. So when, for some reason, people st stop liking your dresses, the fact that you can introduce more at the last minute is what brings value. So I think this is one of the, the uh, measurements of why this, is, this can be important or can be relevant. That in fact there are regimes where the value comes from responsiveness, not so much from novelty. <coughs> Oops. Now, uh, I, we can show uh, in addition to this, the sensitivity to noise. If there is no noise, with this sigma being equal to zero, on the left of the graph, you'd see that novelty has a value of about 4%. Responsiveness has no value, because there is no uncertainty. So you could, anything you can do uh, on, a, on a closed loop, you can also do with an open loop. So. With low uncertainties, novelty is what creates the value. With high uncertainties, on the other hand, you see that they are you know, they are close, very close one to the other. Novelty will help you, and also responsiveness will help you quite a bit. So what this says is in high environment settings, which is usually where these, these people, the fashion industry operates, uh, you can increase profits by so much with in-season introductions, planned in-season introductions, and you can gain the same amount roughly by being responsive. So you can kind of double the impact if you do it on, on a close loop. So um, we have more in the paper. Uh, I think we can, you know, if you are interested, uh, we, can, we can discuss it. Uh, but just to summarize quickly what is in this work is we've be built a model where we develop um, a way of actually doing this dynamic assortment with, uh, uh, with feedback. So main ingredients are um, the fact that these products decay and they're short-lived. And we have a fast fashion uh, system where uh, you can actually res respond in real time. So that, those are like the two main ingredients. Now, so what do we find? We have structure of the optimal policies that is similar to what we have in inventory. Uh, we have extreme cases where we have closed forms. And we show numerically that the values of, of response are a good complement to the value of novelty. Okay. So let me just say, I think we have some about 10 minutes or so, right? Yeah. 
So let me tell you about future work and things that we're investigating right now. Um, so, so some ideas. Um, we are doing um, some collaborations, a few actually, probably too many collaborations with, with industry. And we have databases where we can test these models. So one of the things we're looking at right now is um, checking the data, trying to calibrate the models that I described to see you know, how, how this would translate and what would be the actual gains in this particular case. So what we do, let me just show, this is very tentative, so it's very early. Um, we had one data from one retailer, we aggregate the sales of, of dresses over many weeks, and we built uh, this decision model, this regression model. So what you see is VT would be the attractiveness for these dresses in, the, in a particular week. And we would write them like this. We have a base level of alpha. We would have a decay. Delta would be like the decay, that I, the, the epsilon in the paper, times the previous attractiveness, plus beta n, n would be the new, introdu new product introductions over the week, which would be like the effort you would put in, and some noise. Right? So this is very, very basic model. This is the attractiveness, therefore the market share of dresses in the store you can write as VT divided by 1 plus VT. This is like a one category model. Uh, NT is the number of product introductions. We have data for two years. So this is very simple regression and we're learning to do the sophisticated econometrics, but at this point we're just playing with the basics. Uh, simple regression gives you these parameters, so very small base level. A decay of 0.67, what does it mean? It means that from one week to the next, the value of attractiveness loses, attractiveness will lose a third from week to week. What do you think? To me, this was very high decay. So that means that if you don't do, if, if you put zero, if you put zero new products, if you put new products, People after like four weeks, nobody likes anything in the store anymore. So to me, this is surprising, and we've we've done this in many categories. We always find between 0 0.7, 0 0.8. This is the number that we're getting. And the beta has to do with how much uh, a new product is worth. Um, this is, you know, maybe not. I think the key parameter here is this delta. The R squared is mm, fair, 0 0.67. I mean, yeah. this is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so let me show you now, this is again very basic and we're not claiming, we don't, we're not saying that we have a like econometric contribution here because we, we are not, uh, I mean this is just to inspire future work. Uh, and, and let me show you some of the problems that we're going to face in the econometric part. And uh, this is the actual values are in, 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 the th in the thicker line, the dotted values are the predicted values. So what do you see? You have a peak here that is not captured, you have peaks and you have a lot more fluctuation in the actual values compared to the predicted values. Now, few problems. So this is the beginning of the season. This, well, the beginning of the season. The end of the previous season, the beginning, this is the rebajas effect. So what does it mean? That there is a something external that is kind of influencing the entire sales. And that is not due to this. This probably is a pricing effect that people buy because it's cheaper, not because you've had new products in. Uh, then you have this, uh, uh, a drop here. This is the summer, beginning of the season. So you have seasonality that you need to take into account. Right? And you know, people buy less, you know, uh, dresses in the in the uh, in the summer. So this this is fall winter season. So that th this would be the new collection that you you're going to buy. And uh, probably this is early, so people don't buy that much. Then you have the Christmas effect that here actually we're capturing pretty well, but we have a seasonality problem that we need to take into account that we are not taking into account. Mm -hmm. And then uh, again, this is. 
fluctuations and we, we, we're not very careful in this right now. But we're working to have a more sophisticated models. So that's one, one way of, of, of progress. Let me show you another one. <coughs> so we have other applications in mind and um, I talked to some of you about this. Uh, we have a big database on, on music. So let me share some news from, the, from last Christmas. Beyonce, uh, mid, so in uh, mid-December, 13th of December, launched, by surprise, a new album and released uh, 14 new songs and 17 music videos. And people said, what do, what do you think people said? She's a genius. <laughs> She's taking everybody by, by surprise. She's, um, you know, for marketing, this is very viral, very... And it's the right time to do it. This is just before Christmas. So she puts up a lot of noise just before Christmas, surprise, exclusivity on iTunes, etc., etc. Now, any problem with this that you can think of related to the talk? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just point one. Who is talking about Beyonce today? Nobody. Nobody? Why? Because everybody was talking about Beyonce in December and in January. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now, what do you need to do to, if you're Beyonce, what do you, how do you see this? You had a huge peak because you put all your eggs in December. Yeah. And now, there you have nothing. I mean, you're exhausted. You put all your resources in launching 14 singles at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, is a you know, and, and related to what we've seen in fashion, uh, this is a bad strategy because it's very good. Well, it, the only reason why this may be good is because the demand in Christmas is very, very high. Mm -hmm. So you capture a very high market share in Christmas and you're okay with having a low market share in March. Mm -hmm. That may be a reason. But uh, if demand is kind of flat, this is not such a good idea. So let me give you a counterpart of this. Um, this is Rihanna, and this is from the database that we we're, we're getting. So this, what you see in this in this chart, is week by week the number of times Rihanna songs were played in the radio, 40 stations in Spain, uh, over over about a year and a half, a year and something. So what do you see? What is the approach of Rihanna? Beyonce was put everything together. Rihanna is launching, so this was the, we found love. I don't know if you, you guys are fans of Rihanna, but, no. <laughs> but, but let me tell you what she did. She, she launched, uh, where have you been in this, in week 15 of 2012? That went up and then went down. Then she launched Diamonds, that was a huge hit, went up, went down. And then she launched Stay with, um, uh, in this week, and then went up, and it's going down right now. Now, what, what does it suggest? That Rihanna has a very clear policy of launching singles once every three months. <coughs> now, do you think this is good? First of all, if you add the total market share of Rihanna, it's much more stable than Beyonce probably. Which may be a good thing, may be a bad thing, depends on the demand, but at least it's something you need to be able to, to know, right? As a, as a, at least Rihanna's manager should know this. Now, some other issues is, I don't like very much that the hit, this song was a hit, and now I'm replacing this song when one, once it is dying, I'm going to start playing this one. Or maybe this one is dying because I'm introducing this one. Yeah. Now, what I don't like is that the, this one is stabilizing at a level that is not very high. So my top song is not up in the charts. People, not, that doesn't, they, people do not love this song. So eventually this one dies, and then it's the, it's the new one appears, it's a big hit, and then you launch the new one, you're killing the big hit, you're replacing it by something worse. Now, 
This policy of launching every three months is also, mm, you know, can be improved if you are able to delay songs that come after hits and accelerate songs that come after, you know, bad songs. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be, well, if this one is worse than this one, this one you should put earlier. Now, if this one is very good, let it die alone. Don't kill it yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't cannibalize it. So, an application of our model is actually to do that. This tells you when you should be introducing a new song. This model that I told you about investment, now it's not going to be a continuous decision anymore, it's going to be a, a launch decision, zero, one, but you're going to have the same dynamics. Okay, so we have, right now we have a longer database uh, where we're going to do exactly this, try to fit the different attractiveness of the songs, try to see you know, whether Rihanna is always launching songs at the same level or how much uncertainty there is regarding a song in Rihanna, etc. Et so that's one extension that we're working on right now. Second extension is we have a, we're applying these type of models with the popularity of baby names. And you would say, well, Jeff, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the reason was, this was kind of a toy thing that we did a uh, year ago, uh, where we got five databases, very complete ones and very long ones. This is popularity in the United States for 120 years. So it's a very rich database, so we can calibrate our models very easily. Um, and what we found over this just toy uh, experimentation was that, in fact, it's actually very difficult to do estimation properly. So with this, we're writing a paper on estimation algorithms to, to do that well. Uh, and the reason why this is so difficult is because the models are nonlinear, so you need to uh, maximize like the likelihood function. Um, the number of parameters is huge, so you have maybe, I don't know, uh, 5,000 names over 120 years, so you need to do a lot of data crunching. So imagine the number of log, logs that you have in the, in the likelihood function. Um, so what we, we are testing is different types of models of evolution of the names, and the yellow line would be a model that assumes that is a constant attractiveness, clearly not, 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 good, not, not a good model. The, the green one is an exponential decay uh, popularity or attractiveness function. Again, clearly not very good. Uh, and the ones that work the best are gamma uh, attractiveness models, which by, you know, it's similar to what has been used in the movie with the movie papers. Um, so those fit the demand very well. So with this, what, you know, what, what, do you, what do we expect to do with this? We are writing a paper where there is, a, I think, a, a technical contribution regarding estimation and development of algorithms to do estimation quickly. Not, not easy at all, but we're, we're getting there. Um, and then we are finding with an application to names and to music, uh, we are able with this type of models to predict the popularity of the, the, the names that are in the top 10 today. How are they going to be ranked in 30 years? So we are able to test that and say, well, these ones are going to be, are decaying at this pace. This is actually a very long period, so if you're telling me if 30 years is going to be just a few, few more data points, it's very short, so it, this is working quite well. And more importantly, we're, we'll be able to tell you that in the top 100 in the United States, there are maybe 12 names that we don't know about now, but they're going to be there just because of the dynamics on the, in the statistics, there are names that are born and die, right? So these ones will make it to the top 100 or the top 50 or the top 10, but I don't know which ones will, will, they, they, will, they will be. So I think this is valuable information to just be being able to say that, well, in fact, human taste for names also has a, you know, an evolution, a decay, and well, uh, you know, this life cycle of having a content being born and dying over time. And with this, I think 
I think that, that could be an interesting, interesting insight from the research. And I think that's, that's all I have. So with this maybe, I don't know if we have time for a question or two.